Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. Everything was going to plan yesterday for Wall Street, and suddenly it wasn't. There was a breach of a key level that ignited some buying interest. With more than an hour to go in trading, the S&P 500 was close to unchanged. The final hour, we saw selling that unraveled the market. What happened in the last hour? St. Louis Fed President Bullard said he wouldn't rule out supporting a 50 basis point rate hike at the March meeting. He does not have a vote. His view here is heard, though, at the March meeting. The Federal Reserve has a weird system where, let's say they have 30 governors, only 12 of them get to vote, and they rotate the uh, voters in and out. And I don't know the number of um, Fed governors, but they all represent different regions in the United States, like uh, Western Texas, the uh, West Coast, Pacific Northeast, Pacific Northeast, Pacific Northwest. I'll fix it. I'll fix that in editing. Don't worry. And there will be no editor. But yeah, we're now we're talking 50 basis points. So the Wall, Wall Street just didn't go with that. Uh, indications um, are that the market's a little tired, that it's rallied, that we don't ra- really have a catalyst up. We don't really have that much of a catalyst down, though, as well, other than a recession coming. Well, we did see bad uh, debt numbers come out yesterday. Americans are going deeper into credit card debt. It's a shocking number. Um, And it's something we're going to have to deal with at some point. Uh, When it was lower interest rates, it was a lot easier for the government to carry debt. It was a lot easier for you to carry debt. Like I look at my mortgages, I'm carrying debt, right? Uh, Mortgage at 2.5% is way easier than a mortgage at 6%. And that's the story of the last two years. Cheap money, cheap debt, expensive money, expensive debt. Yesterday, January's produced price index rose seven tenths of a percent on the month, while economists expected a four tenth of a percent increase. So the CPI was stubbornly high, and the PPI is stubbornly high. Retail sales were incredibly strong. Um So that should keep inflation high. It's uh, supply and demand. The demand's there. If the supply is not, you get inflation prices. If the demand for travel is so high that we're all rushing to do vacations, all rushing to do experiences, the cost of vacations are going to remain high. And that's what we learned this week from um, Airbnb. High-flying airline prices, they're not stopping us. Fear of a recession coming. We're like, I'm going to squeeze in a vacation before the recession. I'll pay for it after the recession. Airbnb in their quarter reported a 49% jump quarter to quarter in cross-border trips. So we're not now going to the mountains and staying for a month on vacation. So we don't get COVID. Although, did you hear the COVID cases are rising in San Francisco and the way they they know is by testing fecal matter? Sewage, poop. Um, That's a job I'm glad I don't have. It's not quite a micro kind of job, but it's a job I'm glad I don't have. That's terrible. So demand remains resilient in travel. So you're not going to see, I don't think you're going to see a lot of costs come down right now. The bigger picture is more vacations. Uh, vacationers want more experiences, more, uh, believe it or not, cruises. Is now the time to jump in? It certainly could be. I own shares of Airbnb. Um, they're planning to invest in products in its main accommodation services again, giving it new offerings. If you watch the Super Bowl, if you watch uh, sports right now, you'll see Airbnb commercials are not about, you know, um, a mountain home, they're more about uh, a mountain home on a 7,000 foot high home that sees the most ultimate sunrise. Or they're about going to New York City and seeing a Broadway show, experiences. 
So Airbnb is, is plotting this right. It's interesting because two travel companies that basically do the same thing, Expedia, also known as booking.com, and um, Airbnb, they had two very separate quarters. And I think it's the millennials who are driving the Airbnbs. They're growing up in a generation that's where they, that's, they've known that better than the Hilton or the Four Seasons. So all about experiences. I did a story on millennials a few years back talking about how they like to, uh, they like to experience the now and they're not really planning for the future. And I'm, I'm kind of being shown correct on that one. So yesterday we also learned about EV charging stations are popping up everywhere. This was a weird day um, because Elon Musk was getting along with President Biden and Biden was getting along with Elon Musk. And in the past, Musk feels a little jilted that Biden talks about the car companies with unions. Speaking of which, there are some employees in Buffalo that were getting ready to unionize on Elon Musk and oh, they got fired. So Biden praising Musk to open 7,500 Tesla chargers to other EVs by the end of 2024. If you're a Tesla owner, you're probably upset about that because you got it good right now. All these charging stations are rarely full. Uh, but we're going to sell more charging stations or we're going to create more charging stations. This should be good for Tesla, GM, Ford, ChargePoint, EVgo. They're all investing in charging stations. And, and Biden said, hey, we're going to give you billions of dollars if you, if you play by our standards, make everything uh, intermingle with each other. So, for instance, GM is putting 2,000 fast chargers at Pilot along U.S. highways. Pilot's a gas station. GM is working to install 40,000 level two chargers in U.S. communities by 2026. Ford is installing fast chargers at 1,920 company dealerships. That's kind of an interesting one, right? Um, I think the dealers have a, a pretty interesting chance for a, a business here. You bring in your car, you charge it at their dealership, and they're showing you cars. Hertz and oil giant BP's EV plan to install thousands of chargers in major cities for use by Hertz customers in the general public. Um, what's interesting about that one is, I don't know if you picked up on what I was saying, Hertz and oil giant e, uh, BP. What's a what's an oil giant doing getting in the charging business? Now, the federally funded uh, tax credits that the companies are going to get. Um, one minute. They come with standards. So like the charging station has to be running at capacity at 97%. But again, I'm going to tell you the companies who are going to win, EVgo and ChargePoint. They're electric vehicle charging companies. They're small, and they're going to get billions and billions and billions of dollars in, in government money to build these stations. You look at companies like Enphase. Um, what's interesting is the charging doesn't have to be environmentally good. It can come from coal. It can come from nuclear. It can come from all sources. You would have thought that would have been written in a little bit differently. Anyhow, I'm Rob Black. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter, Rob Black Show, YouTube, Rob Black Show. Anything that you want to talk about, we can talk about money, investing, and more. You can come sign up for an event this weekend. I got a retirement income tax planning event, uh, how to retire the quality of tire from working to retire to living your life. Brought to you by EP Wealth. This is The Rob Black Show. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial money, investing, and more. Thanks for tuning in. Michael Jackson, 60. Uh, Mike, not Michael Jackson. Whoa. Michael Jordan is 60 years old today. That should give you some perspective on where you are in life. He happened right before I went to college. His college started taking off. So that tells you, like, uh-oh, I'm pushing 60 at some point. It's my next big birthday, huh? The NASDAQ was down yesterday, the SP 500 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's a lot of what we thought is going on. There's high valuations in the stock market. They're priced for perfection. Earnings season is a little bit okay. But a lot of companies are saying the same thing. Next couple of months are going to be tough. The good news, it does look like a soft landing for a recession because the job market's holding up, but retail sales also holding up. Inflation is stubbornly high. It's coming down in places. 
but we're not yet at the point where we're going to say, okay, let's stop raising rates. They're going to raise rates. In fact, there may be a case to raise 50 basis points because in between the last reports on the CPI and the PPI, it's not been great news. It's been stubbornly high. It's coming down, but not at the rate that we're, we want to get to, 2 to 4% on inflation. When we're hanging in the sixes, we want to be dropping to the fives. So Wall Street is saying, okay, you may be right. Uh, I don't see a big reason for a huge rally at this point in time. I don't see a lot of stimulus coming from interest rates. I do see stimulus coming from Biden's infrastructure plan. There are some question marks on that. Will he have to sacrifice some of his promises in order to get a balanced budget? Not a balanced budget, excuse me for that. To get the debt ceiling approved? I don't know. Historically, you didn't have to go backwards and take things away. But I think Wall Street's looking at that. And then honestly, you just get a big murderous valuation problem. And the way I can explain this in the simplest of terms for you is I like owning Apple at 22 times earnings. But when it gets to 25 times earnings, I'm like, ooh, that's kind of pricey. If it's at 18 times earnings, I'm like, ooh, 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 that's kind of on the cheap side historically. The market tends to trade around 17. The S&P 500. 17 times earnings. And if we get into a situation where it's at 20, it feels expensive. When we get a situation around 15, it feels cheap. Last year, you could say what you want about the market pulling back. It helped make valuations cheaper. It's a good thing. Get used to me saying that. That unless you're retired, and if you're in retirement without a proper plan, i.e. a drawdown strategy that includes bad years in the stock market, You don't want to be selling your stocks in a down market. You want to be using your cash in a down market. Got a big event coming up March 11th. Get ready for announcement on that quite soon. Over half of millennials expect to inherit money. That was one of the stories this week that I found. I'm not going to say it made me smile, but be careful what you wish for and don't assume that it's going to come the way you want it to. I've been in this business too long and I've seen too many people expect too much from their parents when they pass. And sometimes it works out, but it usually doesn't the way they think it will. There's a new Winnie the Pooh movie, Blood and Honey, a new R-rated film. It shows you that we will watch anything in the United States. The 1920s was a seminal seminal decade for pop culture. Many of the copyright protections on the content introduced, um, it's expired. So Winnie the Pooh, 95 years later, we can ruin him. Sweet, lovable character. We can now make into a horrible, horrible monster. Patents are important. Tigger can't be written in in large part because he wasn't part of the copyright until 1928. He was a late, late coming actor to the story. So Winnie could be a murderous bear. It's kind of weird that Winnie the Pooh and uh, was a cocaine bear. Bad year to be a bear in media, huh? <laughs> Look at the trends. We're awful. YouTube CEO is logging off. Susan Wojcicki, CEO of YouTube. The last nine years stepping down the video site has exploded under her watch. It's $29.2 billion in ad revenue last year, kind of 10% of Google's uh, total sh- uh, sales. Her time at Alphabet predates YouTube. She was Google's 16th employee. She was also its first landlord. She rented out her garage in Menlo Park to Google's co-founders for $1,700 a month. Uh, success or failure starts at the top, and she will be missed. Her consistency, her work. YouTube is an amazing. If it were to spin off, I, I'd leave Google in a heartbeat, the stock alphabet, and I'd go straight to YouTube. I think it's the best part of the alphabet stock. 
my son was talking to me yesterday and he goes, um, you know how much I use my iPad dad? I'm like a lot. He goes, YouTube is so good. It's got so much stuff on it and he's using it to, to learn stuff. I've never had a problem with him. Tesla's full self-driving system delivered a fresh setback. Nearly 363,000 vehicles have been recalled. It's not really a recall. And I, I kind of almost agree with Elon Musk complaining about this. It's a software update that has to happen. The cars affected are the Model 3, the Model X, the Model Y, the Model S, all produced between 2016 and 2023. CEO Elon Musk tweeted, it was just flat wrong. He's been pressured by the national, uh, the NHTSA. They've been investigating Tesla's automated systems since a fatal highway crash in 2016, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It's ramping up scrutiny. So it's going to be an over-the-air software update for free. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Do you think it's a... Are you with me on that one? Does that feel like a recall? Or does it feel like an update? It has to do with... Um, Tesla not seeing objects in crosswalks. Um, I don't know. So the concept of modern trading card game didn't really exist until uh, Magic the Gathering was released. So Magic the Gathering is in all sorts of drama right now. They in Pokemon. One minute. 30 years and 50 plus million players later, Magic the Gathering hasn't lost its magic. Hasbro's business strategy around the game has come under attack. Um, it's a card game that's wildly uh, rare cards create incredible value and power in the game. It's being mismanaged by Hasbro and it is a problem for the company. Sometimes you can go to that golden goose a little bit too much is what it looks like there. So I got a big event coming up in Lafayette at, I'll tell you about it when I come back. You can find me online at RobLuckShow.com. That's RobLuckShow.com. Questions about Social Security? Check out the Social Security Retirement Guide at RobBlack.com. That's RobBlack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. I was going through what... Warren Buffett did and did not do at Berkshire. And let's put some honest spin here. He's probably not making all the decisions at Berkshire Hathaway anymore, right? He's cut his position in Taiwan semiconductor manufacturing. Um, he did not have a huge win on Taiwan semi. But we note he's the greatest of all time investors. He added to his position of Apple, which I find very interesting as I own shares of Apple. Again, disclosure. Apple's up 18% this year. He now owns 5.8% of Apple. That's a large chunk. Let's go to Patrick O'Hare at briefing.com. Patrick O'Hare, I start my day every morning with you on your um, pieces that you put together for briefing. It's insights into the market that I can't really find. Um, I find it useful. It's, it's, it's very helpful for me. So let's talk a little bit about what we're seeing out there today. Are you with me, Patrick? Yeah. Hey, good morning, oh. Rob. I'm okay. here. A little technical difficulty yeah. on my part, but we're working through it. Um, what are we looking at today? It's retail sales, and yesterday was consumer price inflation. Um, in your page one, your headline starts off January retail sales surge. Hmm. That seems like good news. We're spending. The economy is going well. But is it good news? Right. Well, I I think it does matter, you know, how one wants to look at it. Okay. Um, the market, I think, is uh, looks at it with a curious eye, knowing that uh, strong economic data is likely to, you know, keep the Fed on edge about, you know, pausing its rate hikes um, and certainly reinforce its notion that it will keep rates higher for longer uh, and certainly negate any likelihood of a rate cut in 2023. So the stock market, you know, takes a step back looking at strong data through that lens and also, you know, looking at an S&P 500 that's trading at a slight premium to its 10-year historical average. Uh, you know, also invites some potential, you know, some some concerns about valuation uh, against the backdrop of potentially 
um, even higher interest rates. Um, so, you know, economically speaking, you're right. I mean, it is very good news, uh, just like the January employment report was very good news. Uh, but you have a Federal Reserve that is pretty uh, been, you know, stuck to its knitting in terms of suggesting that it, it, it thinks, you know, we need to see some considerable weakening in the labor market to really uh, stamp out the uh, inflation pressures uh, or inflation expectations anyway that it's concerned about because of the tight labor market. Yesterday, I saw that Warren Buffett said positive things about Jerome Powell as the chairman, uh, the Federal Reserve chairman, and he's doing a good job. And he thinks media should be saying better things about him. And I take a lot of my financial social cues from Warren Buffett. If it's good enough to come out of his mouth, I'm probably going to steal and use it myself. What are your thoughts on Jerome Powell at this point in time and the outlook of interest rates likely not going lower this year? Maybe he's causing a recession by keeping rates higher for longer. Jay Powell, thoughts? Well, I think he's 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 doing a good job trying to make up for the big mistake he made. Okay. Um, okay. The Fed, the Fed made. Now he's not he's not the only decision maker at the Fed, right? He he helps drive the consensus at the Fed, and so let's not, you know, pour it all on on you know Jerome Powell that the Fed was late to the game in terms of fighting inflation, right? That was a that was a consensus opinion at the Fed to keep buying. Uh, you know, agency and treasury securities to keep the Fed funds rate at zero percent, even though you had a you know inflation rate that I think was north of six percent at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, what he has done though is they they have pivoted, right? And you know, own up to your mistakes. Um, and and it seems like that's what they're doing. But recognizing that they made the big mistake to begin with, uh, I think they're going to be pre. Uh, adamant about not wanting to make the second mistake in letting inflation continue to run hot. So they're going to, you know, uh, you know, this has been the problem for for the stock market, I think, is that the you know, stock market wants the Fed to be the uh, the old Fed, the friendly Fed. And and that's not where Powell is taking things, I don't think. It's not the type of consensus he's trying to build at this juncture. I think he's trying to maintain, uh, you know, uh, a policy setting body that uh, is committed to keeping rates higher for longer. So, you know, so they don't go down as, you know, the Fed that also let inflation blow back up and create an even bigger problem, meaning they made, you know, mistakes on both sides here. So, so yeah, you know, he's, he's pivoted well, I'd say, but a uh, lot more work to be done. And some of it's being done naturally just by, you know, base level comparisons, um, but there's there's more work to do, you know. A, a CPI rate over six percent year over year is isn't all that stellar. And you take services and you exclude energy services, and you're looking at seven point two percent year over year. You look at food inflation, which obviously every consumer is you know front and center with that. Um, you know, you're pushing ten percent. So uh, there's a lot of work left to be done, and I think that. Uh, the stock market is going to have to get its mind around the fact that this Fed is is not the the Fed of old. It's trying to, you know, become a, a Fed that uh, gets back to you know what normal should look like. Frankly, that was beautifully spoken. You are a craftsman when you talk about interest rates and the Fed Reserve. To add on to this conversation, do you think higher interest rates are okay? No, no, no. Let's strike that. I really benefited from lower interest rates in the last 15 years to the point of I invested in tech companies, tech companies borrowed money, tech companies took basically free money and, and built out platforms that are now creating billions and billions of dollars of profit. Um, am I going to have to get used to a world of higher interest rates or more normal interest rates? I think that's what you just said. Yeah, um, you're right, Rob. I think that that's what I was alluding to, really, is okay. that, you know, we got to get back to normal. Um, and normal, you know, the transition period to normal can be can be a little bit rough at times, because when you had things so good for so long, you forget what normal looks like. You know, and I think, you know, part of the transition, what we've seen even recently with housing, you know, housing demand, right? We saw, you know, rates come down sharply at the beginning of the year here. Uh, and, you know, and you're hearing, you know, realtors now on CNBC saying how they've got multiple offers because people have come back. I think you get a customer saying, OK, you know, if if the mortgage rate's going to be whatever, six and a quarter percent, 
then that's what it is. I can get my mind around it if it's not like fluctuating wildly. Um, but, you know, at the same time, getting back to normal rates, you know, you look at a, uh, I mean, looking at a six month T-bill yield here right now, we're 5%. Um, that's pretty good, you know? Um, and uh, there's, you know, that that's nice for fixed income investors, but, um, but it is something I think that we do kind of have to, you know, to get our minds around and, and we're not there yet. Um, but, you know, once things settle down, there's been so much volatility on, on both sides of things, both stocks and bonds and even the dollar. And, you know, we just need some, some stabilization and, um, and you can make better decisions when you see things, you know, stable here. And then of course you go in buying a home, recognizing that, okay, maybe you're at the higher end of where, you know, rates could be for a while. Uh, which maybe ultimately gives way to a, a potential refinancing option several years down the road. So, you you know, you go ahead and take advantage of buying today with the opportunity perhaps to you know, refinance later at a lower rate. What else do you want to head on? We've got about two minutes left in the segment. Well, you know, something that has been uh, jumping out at me and, and I, can admit, you know, I, we we were in this camp too in terms of like looking at the the market in 2023 as a tale of two halves and uh, thinking that you know you'd see probably a more challenging first half versus versus the second half and that's kind of been flipped on its ear here. We've had a really good start to the year, but um, but kind of what we were saying at the top of the interview, the idea that the Fed is is likely to you know continue to raise rates, going to keep rates higher for longer. Um, you know, the slowdown will start to become more apparent, I think, given the lag effects of those those Fed rate hikes. And it might be more apparent in the latter half, you know, in the second half of the year here. So uh, so we might be staring at a, uh, you know, the narrative being a soft landing for now. Uh, but we might have to come back to entertain the narrative that it will be a hard landing later because of those lag effects. And so we're going to be watching that as it relates to the trend in earnings growth estimates, which are still uh, fairly high for the back half of the year and probably subject to a downward revision from here. I feel like the economy is a big jumbo jet and we're keeping our fingers crossed on a soft landing. Um, And so far, so good. We feel like the captain, Jerome Powell, has this. But like you said, it's going to be a back half end of the story. Um, we've got about 30, 40 seconds left. Anything you want to plug real quick other than briefing.com? Oh, yes. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, the consumer is, is certainly holding up better than I think people would have expected thus far. Yes. And with an unemployment rate of 3.4%, that makes sense. But, you know, it's something we're going to have to keep a close eye on on that end of things here because that's kind of the point of what the Fed is doing is trying to weaken the labor market, which in turn would le- weaken consumer spending. But so far, so good. You've got strong labor market that's lending itself to a better economic outcome than I think some people were expecting at this point. Thanks very much. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. Not my best interview, but he was insightful as always. You can find him at briefing.com. He does a page um, one update every day. Today's headline was January retail sales surge, but markets slow to follow suit. He then goes on to write about the earnings season, what's going on, what's happening with the markets in the, opposed to the ideas of how it's working with the inflation and working with higher interest rates longer genius explanation if you get a chance to re-listen to that i loved the first what's going on question because he hit it out of the park you can find him at briefing.com a reliable source of both domestic and international news find it at briefing.com this interview featured on the rob black show is brought to you by ep wealth learn more at robblack.com so today there's some follow-through on down market action. It's not broad based. It's not panic. We're neither rallying nor are we falling apart. But some of the big winners this week, like Airbnb is down 4.3% today. It's not what for what goes up must come down, but it kind of feels a little bit like we're grinding. Grinding's not bad. I gotta watch what I say here so it doesn't get sexual. Grinding's not bad. Going sideways is okay. Feels better than last year going down, right? Now, going down last year brought down market valuations and made it cheaper. If you think about the stock market as a house, it went from a million-dollar house to a $700,000 house. 
and you'll be fine because slowly over time it will recover. It historically has recovered. I can't promise that, but historically I can say, take a look at the facts. So a lot going on. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the stuff that is important to you. Over half of all millennials expect to get an inheritance. For me, that's an interesting story because my mother died uh, January 21. And it still hasn't been distributed. Her pot, her inheritance. Um, It ended up being more than I would have thought when I was 18 years old. I thought my parents' best thing about them was that my dad had a great military pension. But he also was a pretty good saver. Not a great saver. Pretty good. But then again, he also had six kids. Who can really be a great saver with six kids? I was part of a hand-me-down because I was the fifth boy. I never got the new stuff. I always got the used stuff. Not always, but more often than not. But supporting six kids, that'll, that'll, that'll put a dent in your investments. I got an email yesterday that kind of cracked me up because it shows what's happening in the Bay Area. And it was to a man or um, it was from a man who basically bought a house. And he and his wife have two kids. His question was a little different because in their late thirties, he's got two kids under the age of 10. They just purchased their first home in the Bay area. I know what that feels like because I was in my late thirties when I got married and started having kids and purchasing Bay area. I bought real estate elsewhere. Now for him to do this, he had to use 50% of their savings cash and stock to complete the deal. So he wiped out, he made one mistake in my opinion, he took from his retirement to pay for his home. Now that's easy for me to say, but I never have taken from my retirement for a vacation. I've never taken from my retirement to buy a home. He's asking me after he did it, how can he start saving more? And that's a good question. That's a fair question. I'm totally with that. But if you also just recently, and again, I don't always get all the details in this. He probably sold when the market was down a little bit, but if he sold two years ago, he sold when the market was at a high. So he did a good, you know, stroke of luck of timing. I'm not knocking him because I do think he got not an asset for asset swipe. Over time, stocks should grow faster than bonds. And over time, bonds should grow faster than real estate prices. Real estate has been a big winner, winner, chicken dinner of interest rates that sent 30 year mortgages down to two and a half percent. I should honestly say more like three and a half to four percent for most Americans, because that two and a half percent lasted for like a couple blinks of the eye. I don't think real estate has the same upside unless we go back to a two and a half percent mortgage rate. And I don't think that's going to happen. There's a big difference between getting real estate like two and a half percent like I did in 2021 versus getting it at, hold on, let me make sure I got my dates right. Yeah, I do. Um, At 2023 levels of six and a half percent or 6%, I wouldn't be able to buy as much house. I wouldn't have pursued it uh, over market offers. So my response to him was, you know, late thirties, two kids, you know, I hear you. We're kind of similar dudes, but you dipped in your assets. I didn't. I'm going to have more money than he is in, I don't know his salary, but because I didn't dip into the assets, I was able to figure out how to you know, put the money aside and change my cash flow. Um, he asked for little tips and hints and tricks, and this is an easy one for me. Um, I'm cheap. I don't run heat at night. I don't run heat during from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. I don't run any big electricity. Um, Sometimes I'll bake in the oven, but more often than not, I'll I'll crock pot and and use a a cheaper voltage throughout the day. Um, I don't do, I don't dry clothes during the day. I don't see the point of giving PG&E extra money for 
running my appliances at inconvenient time for them, 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. I save my cash in Flourish, which is getting 4.25% right now, I believe. It could be 4.15. I plan my home purchase a little bit better than he did. I, I'm like... It's going to be 12 months, and I, I concentrate on that 12 months of uh, putting credit card rewards. I concentrate on cutting my budget down on clothing. I, I consciously eat out less. So uh, there's not a good answer. You know, how do you save more? You work more. You earn more. You invest more. You cut down on what you spend. Earn, save, invest in spending. It's it's not that hard. Uh, you have to look at the math yourself, of course. But two kids are going to get more and more expensive as they age into those high school sports and high school tutors and college prep. I'm hearing a lot of speeches from people right now that are talking about um, cutting this pressure on your kids to go to Harvard, cutting the pressure on them going to Stanford and, and going to a prestige college. I think we're going to look back at the 80s and 90s as why did we get so infatuated with prestige as far as colleges go? Because there's some lovely, there's a lot of kids out there who struggle in school and there's some great careers. If my kid were to come home one day and say, dad, I, I don't really want to go to college. I, I want to be an electrician. I'd be like, I think that's awesome. I will support you on that journey. Now, if he comes home a year later and says, I don't want to be an electrician. I want to be a, a, a butcher. i am be like, okay. I think that's lovely. I'm going to support you, but I'm going to run out of saying that at some point in time. Anything you ever want to talk about, we can talk about money investing and more. Let's talk. Let's see what we have here on the menu today. Sony VR2 is coming out and it's it's starting to get reviewed. And the one thing that I, I look at is how much do you really use it? It's something I've I've told my spouse. Like she wanted to get a we we bought a nice home. She wanted to get really nice stuff for it. I totally get that. Um, but she spent twelve to eighteen thousand dollars on a dining room set, and we've eaten at it twice. Now, first and foremost, it took over a year for it to get to us. So in the last seven months since it's been here, we've eaten at it twice. I guess it looks lovely walking past it. There's a lot of kids art supplies on it. There's a lot of the kids homework on it, but it's, it's definitely price per use isn't great. That's why growing up, I always had a problem with luxury cars because it's, you know, price per mile in my head. I try to buy groceries on the price per ounce. I look at stuff like that. I don't know if you do. I know you're saying you must be fun to be married to. <laughs> So my kids are asking for the PlayStation virtual reality too. And I'm like, you know, if you get it, you have to use it. It can't just sit there. It's like the ping pong table. It can't just sit there. It's like the dining room table. It can't just sit there. Um, and I get the feeling a lot of people's VR experience is just going to sit there. Um, AI this week lost a little bit of its luster. I'm not going to say that the AI investment craze is over. And... Just one week ago, two weeks ago, we were talking about the year of chatbot. We were talking about 2023 being the year of AI investments. I have an article, a research article that I can send out to people. They want to drop me an email, rob at robblackshow.com. It's rob at robblackshow.com that, that highlights 75 plus companies in AI. And many of them are up 300%. But, and here's the rub. It already feels like a week later, we're like getting tired of the chat GPT stories. It's like, that's shiny. And the reality is, be careful. Take some gains if you can on occasion. When you're in an area that explodes, there's no shame in taking some gains and paying some taxes. If you're paying taxes ultimately and saving money on the side, it's a good thing. Speaking of good things, from working to retire to living your life, I'm going to be doing a seminar with EP Wealth Advisor Stephanie Richmond. You're going to hear more of her on the show. She's a CFP. She's going to share real life strategies uh, on preparing for the type of retirement you want, defining retirement goals and roadblocks, sources of income in retirement. You know, I said the segment you can really only earn, invest, spend, save. There's not that many action verbs, right? 
There's not that many sources of income, pension, savings, social security, pensions, savings, social security, and much, much more. Big event is coming up Saturday, March 11th, a Saturday event. Easy to get to. Not a lot of traffic. 10 a.m. to noon, Lafayette Park Hotel and Spa. I'm Rob Black. Sign up at robblackshow.com. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com.